Alex was a freelance journalist with a strong interest in the unusual and the paranormal. He had spent years collecting strange, mysterious, and inexplicable stories for niche magazines. He resided in Portland, Oregon, a city known for its historical heritage and urban legends. One day, as he was browsing Craigslist in search of inspiration for his next story, a particular ad caught his attention. A man named Robert was selling a historic house in the heart of Portland. The description of the ad was quite standard, mentioning the age of the house, its unique features, and the price. However, there was a note at the end that caught Alex's interest, buyer beware, the house has a history. Curious, Alex contacted Robert, stating that he was interested in learning more about the house and its history. Robert agreed to meet him, and they arranged an appointment. When Alex arrived at the house, he was captivated by its decaying beauty. Robert welcomed him and began to tell him the story of the house. According to Robert, the house had been built in 1870 by a wealthy merchant and his young wife. However, the wife had died shortly after childbirth, and it was said that her tormented spirit had haunted the house ever since. Naturally, Alex was fascinated by this story and decided to investigate further. In the following days, Alex began to spend his days in the house, recording any unusual events. He noticed doors opening by themselves, lights turning on and off for no reason, and he felt an inexplicable cold in certain rooms. But the most unsettling thing was the whispers he heard at night, which seemed to come from a woman. Alex decided to spend a night in the house to see if he could experience something more intense. During that night, he was awakened by a chilling scream. Panic-stricken, he turned on his flashlight and searched for the source of the noise. But there was no one there. However, on the wall in front of him, he saw something that made his blood run cold, a sentence, written in old-fashioned feminine handwriting, said, help me. That night, after fleeing the house, Alex returned to his apartment, still shaken by what he had experienced. He barely managed to sleep, the image of the words, help me, engraved on the wall was imprinted in his mind. The following morning, on his doorstep, there was a small note. With a growing sense of terror, he picked it up and read it, why won't you help me? The handwriting was the same as that on the wall of the house. Alex felt a cold fear invade him. There was no logical explanation for this. He had told no one about his encounter with the house. In the following days, he continued to receive similar notes, each with the same request. Alex was in panic. He couldn't sleep, he couldn't concentrate, he kept looking over his shoulder, fearing to see something supernatural. The horror he once fervently sought had now become his curse. A week later, Alex was found in his apartment in a state of total hysteria by a friend. He was incoherent, talking about voices and messages from a ghost. His friend immediately called an ambulance, and Alex was taken to the hospital, where he was admitted to a psychiatric ward. Doctors diagnosed Alex with acute stress and paranoia. They began intensive treatment, trying to bring him back to reality. But Alex kept talking about the ghost woman who was tormenting him, insisting that she needed his help. Alex's story became a sort of urban legend in the Portland community. His story was told as a warning of the danger that could come from an obsession with the dark and unexplainable. The house, meanwhile, remained unsold, and the Craigslist ad became a kind of taboo among the site's users. As for Alex, his life had changed forever. What had started as a search for the next big story had turned into a living nightmare. His passion for horror had become his prison, a labyrinth of fear and paranoia from which he couldn't escape. And so, the journalist who had sought the paranormal had himself become part of the legend, a living cautionary tale of the price one might pay when trying to uncover mysteries that perhaps are better left in the shadows. Leah was an occult enthusiast living in the quiet town of Bangor, Maine. Always fascinated by the paranormal, she loved collecting quirky and mysterious objects. One day, while browsing Craigslist, a particular ad caught her eye, an ancient Ouija board being sold by a man named Mr. Morrison. 
According to the ad, the board dated back to the early 1900s and seemed to emit a peculiar energy. Leah couldn't resist. On the day of the meeting, Leah was greeted by Mr. Morrison, an older man with penetrating eyes. He presented her with the Ouija board, a dark and unsettling object engraved with strange symbols. Leah was instantly captivated and purchased the object without hesitation. Returning home, Leah decided to try out the board that very night. In the early hours of the morning, with only the crackling of the fire as company, Leah placed her fingers on the planchette and asked her first question, is there anyone here with me? The response was an immediate and scary scribble, yes. In the following days, Leah continued to use the board, communicating with what seemed to be a spirit named Elizabeth. But as time passed, things began to change. Objects in the house began to move on their own, and Leah often heard whispers in the night. One night, Leah woke up to find the Ouija board on her desk, even though she was sure she had put it away in the closet. On the planchette, a word had been etched, help me. Leah began to feel increasingly nervous and uneasy, feeling that she may have unleashed something she couldn't control. Despite her fear, Leah decided to face the situation. One night, sitting in front of the board, she asked, Elizabeth, what do you need? The board answered with a single word, freedom. Worried and frightened, Leah decided to return to Mr. Morrison to learn more about the board. The man, seeing the fear in Leah's eyes, apologized for not telling her the whole story. The board, in fact, had been found in an old abandoned house where, in the early 1900s, a young woman named Elizabeth had been locked up and died under mysterious circumstances. It was said that Elizabeth's spirit was trapped in the board. Leah, now aware of the power she possessed, decided to free Elizabeth's spirit. She went home and, with a bravery she didn't know she had, sat in front of the board. She asked Elizabeth how she could help her and the board responded with a series of directions that led Leah to an old crypt in the local cemetery. Here, Leah found Elizabeth's remains and, with a prayer and a ritual learned from Mr. Morrison, she managed to free the young woman's spirit. Returning home, Leah felt the house lighter and calmer. The Ouija board no longer responded and Leah knew that Elizabeth was finally free. After Elizabeth's liberation, Leah expected relief, a return to normality. Instead, what followed was a nightmare that would surpass her wildest imagination. With Elizabeth's departure, it seemed that Leah had opened a portal between the spirit world and her own. She began to hear whispering voices, voices that sometimes spoke to her, sometimes screamed at her. At night, her house seemed to resonate with invisible footsteps and spooky laughter. <laughs> Objects disappeared or were moved, lights turned on and off on their own, and sometimes Leah woke up in places in the house where she did not remember falling asleep. Leah consulted psychologists, doctors, and even the local pastor, but nothing seemed to help her. Her life had become a continuous horror, her rest continually disturbed by nightmares and terrifying apparitions. That's when she met Father Carlos Rivera, a priest known for his experience in exorcisms. Leah told him her story, of how she had used the Ouija board and freed Elizabeth's spirit, and how she had been tormented ever since. Father Carlos listened attentively and nodded. You made a grave mistake, he said. But we can fix this. I must exorcise you. It won't be an easy or pleasant process but it's the only way to free you from this torment. In the following months, Leah underwent numerous exorcisms. They were exhausting and terrifying sessions, during which she felt the voices screaming and protesting inside her. But Leah resisted, determined to free herself from this nightmare. After many sessions, in the summer of 2017, Leah woke up from an exorcism and felt different. The voices were gone. The house was quiet. Father Carlos, looking at her, smiled. It's over, he said. You're free. From that day on, Leah dedicated herself to telling her story, urging people not to play with forces they do not understand. Following her experience, the Ouija board was destroyed to ensure it could not cause damage again. 
Today, Leah is a motivational speaker and activist, traveling the country to tell her story and warn against the dangers of the occult. Her story serves as a strong warning, there are things in the world that we do not understand, and sometimes, it's better to let them remain unexplained. Many people view Craigslist as a resource, a place to buy, sell, or trade goods and services. But in the dark heart of Los Angeles, a city known for its dazzling lights and deep shadows, Craigslist had become a hunting ground for an individual who would come to be known as the Craigslist serial killer. Josh was a simple man with a simple goal, to search for unmissable deals on Craigslist. He worked as a plumber and spent his free time hunting for tools on sale at a good price. One day, a particularly enticing ad caught his eye. An individual was selling a set of high-quality plumbing tools at an extremely low price. The only catch was that the address provided was in a secluded, run-down area of the city. But the offer was too tempting for Josh, so he decided to take a chance. Upon arriving at the location, Josh found an old, abandoned factory. It seemed odd to him, but he figured that the individual could be a collector or a junk dealer. He entered the building and was immediately struck by a pungent smell. He couldn't identify it, but he felt a chill of fear run down his spine. It was there, in the heart of that labyrinth of concrete and rust, that Josh met his fate. A man suddenly appeared from the shadows, wearing a mask that hid his face. Before Josh could react, the man attacked him. The police found Josh's body a few weeks later, hidden in a remote corner of the factory. His death sparked a series of investigations that would uncover a chilling string of murders. In the following months, more bodies were discovered, all linked to ads on Craigslist. Each victim was an individual who had responded to an ad for a seemingly irresistible deal, only to be found dead in abandoned locations. The modus operandi was always the same, which led the police to believe that they were dealing with a serial killer. The media dubbed the murderer the Craigslist serial killer. Panic spread through the community, with people fearing they might be the next victim every time they responded to an ad. Despite increased security and media attention, the killer continued to strike. For years, the Craigslist serial killer seemed always one step ahead of the police. But eventually, even the most cunning criminals make a mistake. An ad for a vintage motorcycle caught the eye of a homicide detective named Miller. As a motorcycle enthusiast, he recognized the motorcycle in question as an extremely rare model, which raised his suspicions. He decided to respond to the ad, hoping to lure the killer into a trap. Miller's plan worked. He met the killer in an old warehouse, but this time, the police were ready. The Craigslist serial killer was finally arrested and brought to justice. And so, even with the true, Craigslist serial killer, behind bars, the city of Los Angeles found itself once again on the edge of panic. The murders continued in the same terrifying manner, casting a dark light on the sense of triumph the police had felt after the arrest of the first killer. The twist was a chilling reminder of the reality of crime, and the dark, frightening imitation it could inspire. In a chilling post on the dark web, an anonymous individual claimed to be the imitator. They stated that they wanted to be famous, and that the best way to do so was to emulate the infamous serial killer. This revelation caused panic to spread even more rapidly, as people realized that the danger was not yet over. The police intensified their investigations, hoping to stop the new killer before they could claim more victims. Despite their efforts, however, the killer always managed to elude their capture. The killer seemed to be one step ahead of the police, changing their mode of luring on Craigslist. They no longer limited themselves to selling only tools or various objects. Now they offered a variety of services, from gardening to electronics, making it even harder for the police to predict their next move. Despite the ongoing investigations and efforts of the police, the identity of the new serial killer remains a mystery. The hunt continues, with the police and citizens hopeful that the game of cat and mouse will soon come to an end. 
In the meantime, the story of the Craigslist serial killer serves as a cautionary tale to all individuals using online platforms for purchases and sales. While the internet may offer a wide range of opportunities and conveniences, it also presents risks that should never be overlooked. In an increasingly connected world, personal safety must remain a priority. In a quiet Chicago neighborhood, the wind whipped the deserted streets. Twilight anticipating a stormy night was closing in. Mary, a young woman lively and full of life, had just returned home after a long day at work. She had just ended a problematic relationship with her ex, Mark, a man who turned out to be jealous and possessive. Mary was an avid user of Craigslist. She used it to sell old items, seek deals, or find local services. That evening, as she scrolled through the listings on her laptop, she saw an ad that caught her attention, beautiful vintage jewelry set for sale. Modest price for quick sale. A lover of vintage jewelry, Mary could not resist the temptation and responded to the ad. The seller seemed kind and accommodating, willing to deliver the jewelry set that very evening, at Mary's home. Something seemed odd to Mary about all this, but the prospect of adding a unique jewelry set to her collection made her irrational. Later that night, the intercom buzzed. Mary, excited, opened the door to find a hooded man, holding a jewelry box. But before she could say a word, the man pushed her into the house, closing the door behind him. Terrified, Mary recognized Mark's voice when the hooded man spoke, you thought you could just easily get rid of me, Mary? Mark had planned everything, he had used Craigslist as a vehicle for his dark plan. He planned to kill her and make it look like a robbery gone wrong. But what Mark did not consider was Mary's indomitable fighting spirit. While Mark was distracted, trying to tie her up, Mary punched Mark in the stomach and ran to the kitchen. Grabbing a frying pan, she turned just in time to see Mark approaching her. With all the strength she had, she hit Mark in the head with the pan, leaving him dazed. In that state of confusion, Mary managed to escape from the house and call the police. Mark was arrested, and Mary survived, traumatized but alive. After the terrifying encounter with Mark, Mary could no longer look at Craigslist with the same eyes. What was once a source of advantageous offers and hidden treasures, was now only a painful reminder of a night she would rather forget. She decided not to use the platform anymore. Mary gradually recovered from the traumatic experience, trying to rebuild her life. She decided to focus on her job and started attending a self-defense class, determined to never be caught unprepared again. However, fate had another twist in store for Mary. Several months after the incident, a friend showed her an ad on Craigslist. An ad that seemed eerily familiar. It was another vintage jewelry set for sale, with the same description as the one that attracted Mary that terrible night. Shaken by a premonition, Mary contacted the police. After an investigation, they discovered that Mark had an accomplice. A person who had helped elaborate the plan and who continued to use the same method to attract other victims, despite Mark's arrest. But there was another twist. During the investigation, the police discovered that the IP address of the ad led to a hospital internet connection. After further investigation, the police arrested a nurse who worked at the hospital where Mark had been admitted after being hit in the head by Mary. The nurse was Mark's ex-wife, who had conspired with him to take revenge on women who, they believed, had ruined their lives. The arrest of the nurse finally brought some peace to Mary. However, she decided to never go back to Craigslist again. From then on, every time she heard about the platform, she could not help but remember the twisted faces of Mark and his ex-wife, a chilling reminder that evil can hide even in the most unsuspecting situations.